Welcome back to another UNC Tar Heels basketball recruiting podcast here on TarHeelIllustrated.com. And if you're watching us on our fast-growing YouTube channel that is called Tar Heel Illustrated, I'm THI publisher Andrew Jones, and joining me is our director of basketball recruiting, Mr. David Sisk, longtime AAU college and high school coach. He has seen it all, and David has seen these four kids that we're going to talk about tonight. He's, he's been tracking them every week when we uh, go over what the, the sign kids are doing in their high school seasons and also – what some of the big time targets and committed kids, one committed kid for the class of 23, Simeon Wilcher. So we're in this podcast, we're going to hit on Seth Trimble, uh, the scorching hot Tyler Nichols, Simeon Wilcher, and everybody's favorite topic right now, it seems like is Gigi Jackson. So David, let's go ahead and dive into it. Seth Trimble, the four-star point guard, number 32 overall in the l- most recent Arrivals.com rankings. He's six foot three point guard from just outside Milwaukee. He's playing very, very well. So, uh, how, how are things going with him lately? Well, you know, you were talking about scorching hot Tyler Nickel, really. I mean, they're all scorching hot. So, yeah. I went down here. We're, we're um, um, actually doing this on Sunday night, and we've got, I've got a story coming up uh, that by the time this is out, it'll probably already be published. Uh, about uh, the results from the past week. But, um, you know, he said Trimble had three games this week. He had 24, 11, and six in his first game. <laughs> uh, Friday night, he had 41 points and eight rebounds. And then uh, Saturday, the next night, he had uh, 34 points. So he's averaged 33 points, scored 99 points in three games. Um, the thing that I noticed, is that, um, man, all their games are tough. They had four uh, total overtimes this week. One was a triple overtime game in uh, their first one, and then uh, Saturday night's game was an overtime. So you're talking about um, the one game that wasn't an overtime was 79-74. So these are hard-fought games. It's against good competition. Um, You know, there are a lot of – really good players come out of Wisconsin and they've got a good team. And uh, I think as far as statewide competition goes, uh, it probably doesn't get a whole lot better than what they're playing against there. So, you know, he's very athletic. Not only does he score, he gets assists, he gets rebounds, you know, with his athleticism, he's able to do a lot of things. But uh, this is a guy this year uh, that you look at, you know, he's starting to – he's starting to put a lot of points up. So not only do you have a guy who is going to be a very athletic, bigger point guard, you know, at the University of North Carolina, you're also looking at a guy who uh, who can get his shots too, it looks like. Uh, did you see his tweet? I think it was last night, or Saturday night. We're recording this on Sunday night. Uh, he tweeted something to the effect of, you shouldn't chant overrated with 10 minutes left in a game. Yeah. Yeah, And obviously, whatever they were playing, they were on the road, the fans were chanting that, his team came back and won. I like that. I like that tweet a lot. I When, you, when you're when talking about the way he played this way and the numbers he put up in really competitive games, and then he puts out a tweet like that, that's a little bit of moxie, but that's moxie in which you can back up. And he's a, he's – uh, you know, going back to what his coach said, told you a lot this past summer, uh, his AAU coach about how he's a little bit younger, but he's really just kind of finding himself as a player. To me, all that connects with what his coach was saying. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I could see him uh, saying that he he's very expressive. And I know when I've talked to him on the phone, he's as pleasant as anyone, any kid I've ever spoken to. I mean, he is just an outgoing uh, kid that's full of life, full of energy, vitality, you can tell. And uh, I can see that. I can see him winning a game and saying, you know, don't don't chant over eight and 10 minutes. From my experiences with him, I see that. But like I said, he, his personality seems to fit his style of play. And like I said, it's, it's just very energetic you know, and so North Carolina fans, when you ask what can you expect, you know, I think you're going to get a kid that uh, is uh, just as far as quick twitch and uh, just uh, uh, constant energy is going to be on the high end. 
I think the Carolina fans will enjoy that. Tyler Nickel, they'll enjoy that stroke. And you know, you've been tracking for a while since last summer uh, when it made it into all of your pieces. And I think it's very relevant about how he's on track to become the all-time leading scorer in Virginia high school basketball history. And the talent that has come out of that state over the last 75 years and probably longer is really unbelievable. It's one of the better states in the country at producing talent from all over the state. Tyler Nickel this past week didn't disappoint. I mean, when I say scorching hot, scorching hot. Yeah, I guess next in line is JJ Reddick, which is big time company. So catch everybody up to date with what Tyler Nickel has been doing. Uh, two games this past week, he scored 48. Uh, in the first game and then scored 43 yesterday. So it's 91 points in two games or a 45.5 point average. Um, I have him now. This is not official, but from what he started out, the totals, if they're correct of, of what I've got here, he has uh, 2,206 career points right now. And uh, J.J. Reddick's next, next on the list at 2,214. So he needs eight to tie, and he's still got uh, a lot of this season to go. I mean, they're still in the first half. They started later. They're still in the first half of their season. I think uh, uh, Mac McClung is right around 2,800 or, or so. So he's he's starting to really put a dent in it. And you're looking now, um, every game he plays, he's well up into the 30s. I would say probably around 35 points a game or over. I don't have <laughs> – an exact average, but man, he, he's just every night, he's just filling it up. And didn't he coming in? Didn't he have to average around 29 a game? I think it is and, and play the, the regular number of games of the year. And he yeah. would have actually passed McClung. So he's well, he's way ahead of the pace right now. Yeah. Yeah. And he's it, like I said, you, you put together a 45 point per game week and you're going to give yourself some breathing room, but you know, he, he's, and, and you know, Every team that he's played so far this year, that he's probably – well, there's no probably to it. I mean, he's been option one, option two, and option three in her game plan. So he's seeing boxing ones. He's seeing double teams, triple teams, face guards. And, you know, it, it, it seems like it hasn't had much impact on, on him being able to, to produce. As someone who has been around this a long time at the various levels, when a kid – uh, is all was already highly prolific at scoring. When he's able to take it up another notch his senior year, is that just – what does that tell you about a player? Does that mean that his game has gotten better? Does that, and I know you don't know all the stats. You don't watch all the games. Does that mean that he's more a focal point? What do you do with high school when you have a kid that that's good? You just feed him every time because you got to make the other dudes happy. Or from what you're able to gauge from Tyler Nickel, has he added something to his game that's made him even more efficient, more prolific? What you say to the other four players is you see this thing over here, it's called a bench. And if he doesn't get the ball, that's where you're going. So, <laughs> I love you know, that. You just, oh, yeah. You just, yeah, just give him the ball. No doubt about it. But, yeah, his game is – and, look, if you work, it's like anything else. If you work and put in the time, you're going to get better. You've got no choice but to get better. So, I guarantee you he's a kid's a gym rat. He keeps working on his, on his craft. And not only do you keep working on what you're doing, you expand it. You get stronger. Your shooting range gets deeper. Your ball handling gets tighter, and your degree of you're, you're able to score more on a degree of difficulty. You start being able to score off moves, off more moves. You you, you're, you you learn how not only to get that quick first step, but how to create space from the time you pick your ball up to the time you get your shot off. These guys, when they shoot, they're never just taking a dribble and going straight up and shooting a ball. They're back off one foot. It's change of pace. They're fading away. They're jumping away from the defender and still being able to make that shot. So, you know, yeah. he, not only is he perfecting his craft and scoring, he's expanding it. Uh, the other two members of the class of 22, uh, 2022, Jalen Washington is not playing. He's injured, so he's not playing this season. The other guy, Will Shaver, I know we didn't plan on talking about him, but he's in Chapel Hill now. 
we ran a couple of photos on our site and I think I tweeted one. I did tweet one out uh, Saturday as well uh, with him sitting on the bench. And after the game, you know, we, we don't have the media room open this year. So we work from our, our, our spots that we sit in during the games. And, and he, when I was actually doing my three things video with Jacob Shaver was back there working out, he was working on some left-hand stuff, just some basic stuff around the room, had a couple student managers with him, but I did get a chance to watch him for a few minutes. And uh, it's a pretty big kid, David. I know you saw him, I don't know, it was six months ago, I guess it was in, in one of those uh, AAU events that you went to, but he, he, he's a big kid. And he looked kind of mobile. Some of the stuff he was doing, he looked kind of fluid. So that's just a small snapshot for me, seeing him do some stuff after a game with nobody else really in the gym. But at least we got to see him. And for people that were wondering, he's now in Chapel Hill. He's not going to play, but he's going to work out. And uh, he'll, he'll, he's will he got a head start on some of the other guys, but maybe something that he probably needed. And he'll develop a lot just being around the guys. And I'm sure there are people that ask when he made the announcement that he was going to forego his senior season at uh, – as far as playing season at IMG and go to um, North Carolina for the second semester, people were thinking, what in the world is he doing? You know, but uh, he could have gotten, yeah, he could have gotten a lot at IMG. There's no doubt. And if he would have went a lot of places, I would do a lot of second guessing, but let me tell you something. What, kind of tutelage is it that he could get watching Armando Baycott right now? Because he's got that similar frame. He's the next big coming down the line. And, man, if I was him, I would find out what kind of toothpaste Armando Baycott uses, what he eats for breakfast, what color his boxing shorts are. Uh, I'd, I'd know. I'd do exactly what he does, everything. And, you know, also in practice, I don't know as far as reps go what he'll get. I'm not there. I don't know what he'll get with the starters. But anything he can learn from Armando Baycott, and I'm telling you, if he's on the defensive scout squad and he gets to defend him and play against him, I'm sure there's going to be some pickup. And then once the season, that may be when it really gets invaluable, is after the season's over, you're already on campus. You're getting all that pickup time against him. Man, yeah, I mean, you you talk about just a April, May, and June. Uh, he'll get two and a half, three months extra pickup time. I mean, it's like it, I mean, it, it'd be like uh, sitting under a tree of Aristotle or something. You know, you're you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're. I mean, you you just think about how much better you get doing that. That's the first Aristotle reference in a THI podcast, and uh, maybe it should be the last because that's just way above everybody. My head for sure. Well, and I, I, but I, I was thinking about you. I sent you, I shot a clip and sent it to you. It wasn't much, but just to show you that he's there and, and kind of get an idea of what, what they had him doing. And they have a pro, they have a plan for him and he'll follow the plan. And I thought it was kind of cool to see him. Times are different. College sports are changing rapidly before our eyes. I know you've got a kid that got arrived early at Kentucky and Calipari was talking about him the other day and all that kind of stuff. So these are different types. Simeon Wiltshire cannot arrive for a while. He's class of 2023. He committed back in mid October. In fact, it was during the late night event that kind of kicked off the season in a public uh, manner for Carolina. Uh, He's a six foot five point guard, number 15 in the class. He's from Roselle, New Jersey. Another guy who's getting it done, David. I tell you something I've noticed here about Hubert's recruiting. None of these kids are playing at the elite basketball factories like IMG, Montverde, Oak Hill, La Lumiere, Sunrise Christian, and the list. Uh, Arizona Compass goes on. List goes on. Most of these guys are playing with their local schools, and this is a theory. And it's just not for rivals, it's across the board that these guys don't get seen as much during the winter as a kid that's, you know, I mean, you look over the, the week from Thursday through Saturday, Montbird, IMG, Sunrise Christian, um, La Lumiere, um, a lot of those Oak Hill, those schools were on ESPN Thursday through Saturday. So they get that coverage. 
they get the national recruiting analysts coming in and watching them play several times. But, you know, there I know Jamie Shaw got to see Tyler Nickel play yeah. Saturday. But they may go all year long and not get to see uh, Seth Trimble play. So it's kind of hard. You're just going by the stats and things. And it's really hard to make that move into rankings when that's the case when you've not seen them. Uh, Simeon, he's kind of at a place at Roselle Catholic. You know, their first game of the year was on national television against Camden. And they still, in New Jersey, up where they're at, that's a prolific program in that state. So, and being that close to New York City, he gets to get seen some. And he's a kid that I think is going to make a major jump, uh, could make a major jump well into the top 10. He's ranked number 15 by rivals now. G.G. Jackson is in the same boat simply because they're playing a national schedule. Now, they're taking it on the chin, Ridgeview is, but they're playing a national schedule, so everybody's getting to see him quite a bit. But if you look at Welcher, man, I, I really got probably as much of a look at him as Camden as I'd seen all year, first game, if, or that I'd seen of him, and man, he was explosive. Golly, man, he just looks like every time he gets a ball, he's just shot out of a cannon. Uh, whether he's getting to the rim, he's explosive on his pull-ups. I mean, it is just, just lightning fast dribbles, and he pulls up for that jumper. It's a quick, fast twitch jump. It looks like he's jumped off a shot off a trampoline when he <laughs> shoots the ball. Uh, and he can pass the ball, and, and man, he is really dynamic. Uh, you know, he had um, he's had a bunch of games where he's flirted with triple doubles. Um, Tuesday, he had 13 points, 12 rebounds, and nine assists. Now, this is a very Ooh. talented team at North Carolina. They have another player that's an underclassman that North Carolina is recruiting too, and it's a very talented team. And then uh, earlier uh, today on Sunday, he had 13 points and 13 assists. So he's double doubling almost every game, and he's getting close to triple double. So he actually had Thursday night 14 points, 10 rebounds, and 10 assists. So wow. you're seeing Sammy Wilcher is not going to be a guy that's going to be like a Tyler Nickel that's going to score, go out, and score uh, 40 back to back nights. That's not his game because that team's good. The ball gets distributed. But I'm going to tell you what, he takes over the game in a, in a number of facets, man. He does a lot of stuff really, really good. And if you look up, he's just, just dominating the game by stuffing the stat sheet all the way across. And, and his, man, he, his just dynamic offensive abilities is on a different level. When a kid has the reputation he he does and is as highly ranked as he is and is a junior is already committed to North Carolina as he has, and yet he's feeding teammates and he's going to his local school and he's not at one of those IMGs like you said, but he's unselfish and he's respecting his teammates all because if you're getting 10 assists, you're not getting them to one guy. You're feeding multiple guys there. What does that say about the mindset of a player like that? Yeah, and I like his dad too. I spoke with his dad a lot, a lot in the last few months, and they're just uh, always enjoy talking to him, texting with him, and they're they they just seem like I I, I just I, I like the way they are. I, I just like them, and uh, I, I he he just really really seems like that kind of kid playing that that you know he's about his teammates and and you know Seth trembles like that. You know, when you look at his numbers, you talk about guys that are coming in to be the to, to point guards and to be ball handlers at North Carolina. We talked about that with Trimble. Yeah, Trimble has some big game scoring, but I, it's like I said, he affects – man, he just dishes the ball and defends and they're both bigger guards. And I see a lot of similarities, but they're all about the team. And, and that tells me a lot uh, yeah. about these guys too, like you say, about loyalty. I can say the same thing for Seth Trimble. I can say the same thing for Tyler Nickel. I could say the same thing for Washington. Uh, you know, Montverde and Oak Hill and places like that, they'd welcome them with open arms. And yeah. just because guys go there, they got to do what's best for them. That's not a knock on any player. No, no. We, we, we took some hits 
when I coached AAU because we had some players left local high schools and went to Oak Hills and places like that, you know, back years ago before yeah. it could be as commonplace it is now. The kids got to do what's best for them, but I really respect what they do, and, and obviously they show a lot of loyalty. Way back in the Flint Hill and Harker Prep days out of D.C. area, right? <laughs> I have Some no idea schools. <laughs> they, were, they were the big ones back when I was growing up and when I was living in D.C., Harker Prep and, and Flint Hill. Um, and, of course, everybody knew about Oak Hill. G.G. Jackson yeah, is a guy a that – We had a couple of kids that played AAU in, back in the 90s that went to Oak Hill. Man, it's before mm-hmm. Steve Smith had any gray hair. I remember and, seeing uh, we, McGinnis we and Stackhouse play there. Some places where we couldn't get kids because, you know, high school kid, coaches in certain areas were really upset. So, yeah. you know, it, it's, it, it's a, it's a, it can always be a sticky situation. But I think now it's more accepted. And I think even like high school coaches see, hey, you know, this is what's best for the kid when they do that. So, like you say, it's it's a whole new world now. It's what, whatever the kid is comfortable doing, whatever they want to do in the end. It, it, you could see it as a positive either way, whatever decision they make. Gigi Jackson is somebody that can play anywhere for anybody. They're in the coach in America that wouldn't want him on, on it, that wouldn't want him to be a part of their program at, either now or at some point. So, a uh, five star kid, class of 23, number 10 overall player in the class. He's not committed. He's the only one that we've talked about today that is not committed to North Carolina, out of Columbia, South Carolina. You alluded to him a minute ago. You said his team's playing a national schedule. They're losing a few games. How is he doing, and how do you see him progressing so far? You know, Gigi is probably the greatest thing that's happened to Ridgeview, I would think, because here's the thing. You can't look at the team's record, I don't think, and get a fair assessment of them or uh, Gigi. When you look at the record, I mean, they're sub 500. But what happens is when you've got a top five player in a 2023 class, and Gigi Jackson's a top five player, every big tournament in the country wants Ridgeview because they want Gigi Jackson. Another example is Brandon Miller, who's going to Alabama, goes to Cane Ridge High School right outside Nashville. They're playing local or not local, national tournaments, a Solomon Memphis at the Battle of the Bluff, and they're playing Kenwood out of Chicago. And uh, they went, um, I think it was Missouri, and they played North Little Rock, who may be the best public school in the country. And I'm like, man, there's uh, they can't be competitive in those games. But because you've got Brandon – all these national tournaments want you in. You couldn't get a sniff if you didn't have a player. So they all want uh, Gigi. So what happens is, and it's great for Ridgeview, but they're they're really playing teams that they're going to have a hard time competing against. So you can't judge Ridgeview by that. You can't judge Gigi by the record. Now what's going to happen is now they're going to get back into league play in South Carolina and you see a team right now, like I said, at side 500, don't be surprised if they don't lose again till March or if they lose again the rest of the year if, that, if, they could, if they start to play the local schedule. And it's going to make you better because when the teams that they're going to play, it's, it, it's, it's going to seem a lot easier after you're going up against some of the teams that they've gone up against. Now, they had a good week. Uh, they were in New Orleans this week at the um, – I'm looking here, the, the uh, All-State Sugar Bowl National Prep Classic, and they won two out of three games. Mm-hmm. So they had a good weekend. Uh, but he, uh, he – one night he had 11 points. Another night, 11 points, 18 rebounds. So he goes from one night at 11 points to the next night at 40. So he's mm-hmm. seeing the same thing that uh, Tyler Nichols seeing, like I said, in the scouting report. He's emphasis A, B, C, D, E, all the way to Z. You know, so he's going to see double teams, triple teams, chasers, you know, face guards, you name it. He had 22 points in the third game. But, you know, he was named over the – the just to tell you the schedule that they played and how well he's done, he was named the MVP of the Bow Bash. He made all tournament teams at the Tarkanian Classic. Wonder where that was played. Well, Las Vegas. 
That was then, going on when Carolina was up there. In fact, the yeah. Carolina staff went and saw him. Yeah. And then the Chick-fil-A uh, classic down at Columbia, which has become a really big deal. They have a really a lot of good teams from all over the country. And then they just play, like I said, the All-State uh, Sugar Bowl National Prep Classic just outside of New Orleans. So that tells you they've been to New Orleans. They've been to Las Vegas. Uh, and so, you know, they're they're – seeing a lot of tough competition, a lot of good teams. And, you know, I know it's probably frustrating for Gigi at times because it's just not like he can fit in. And, and you know, every time he gets the ball, he's getting a five guys on him. But, you know, all that makes him better. He's making a major, major push, just like Simeon Wilcher, to be a top five player. And Gigi's actually making a push that he might even get into the top two or three. I know that you said the last time we talked about Gigi about six weeks ago, I think we did a podcast. We talked a lot about him that you didn't really expect much to happen during the season, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask you uh, any movement, anything. I just, you know, we know that Carolina, the whole staff went and saw him in Vegas when they were out there or most of the staff, I guess. So uh, anything new on that front? He, I'm, I'm really kind of glad you asked it. He is going to take a visit to Duke official visit later uh, this month. Okay. Now I think we'll probably get a little better gauge after that visit. Uh, I've said this, he has gotten a lot of projections to North Carolina and I do feel like North Carolina is in the top two. Okay. Uh, he is going to from from what sources tell me, it's really close to it. And I've, I've spoken with them and stuff. And I've not really spoken with them as much about recruiting as of late, but a lot of people that are around there that he is going to – he's probably going to be a player that's going to take all five visits. Now, this is just kind of getting a feel for it. Yeah, The player that's going to take all five visits, he's going to cut it to five, take five officials. And he has said he wants to – make a decision by the summer. So uh, a lot of that's going to be based on visits here this winter and through the spring. I think of the five, some names that really kind of stick out are, are North Carolina, is Duke, is Georgetown, is South Carolina. And anytime you have a player of his talent – there is always, always, no matter who it is and no matter where they're going, there's always got to be the thought of the professional ranks. But I'm going to tell you this. I would have thought a lot more about a year ago than I would now because the NIL decision is probably the worst thing that's happened to the G League and overtime league and things like that. Yeah. Because we NIL talked is, about that a lot in the summer. Yeah, NIL is a huge deal now that, hey – we're not going to be sitting here with our feet and hands tied while the G League offers a kid $500,000 when he can go somewhere now and it's perfectly legal through NIL and not through the University of North Carolina or through Duke or through those coaching staffs, but they have the framework set up where players can be educated and they can find out how to market their brand and they can have sponsorships and they end up making a lot of money, as it should be. So that happens. It gives – you don't feel like you're, you've got a slingshot at a gunfight. You know, you, you've yeah. got an even chance. So I think in the end, I think North Carolina or Duke are going to be hard to beat in this thing. I've not been one of these people that have jumped totally on a North Carolina bandwagon in this early on with all the projections simply because it didn't make sense to me to do that when he's not even visited Duke yet. Yeah, so I, agree. I think after the Duke visit, we'll start to get a better idea. Things may get some clarity, but I do think – right now that, that and I'm not saying it's hundred percent. I'm not saying here, Hey, he is either going to go to North Carolina or Duke, but I'm going to say this. I do feel that if he goes somewhere else besides those two from everything I'm here right now, that it's going to be an, an upset. So um, if you want a good old 
Blue Blood, North Carolina, Taba- uh, North Carolina Tobacco Road, Tar Heels, Blue Devils, Battle on the court. Well, you may have one off the court, too, as you go for one of the top players. It's, it's really – there's not been a good recruiting battle for North Carolina and Duke in a while. It's so, been a while. And this will be a – this will get that John Shire, Hubert Davis rivalry going yeah. pretty pretty well. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, and by the way, to your point about the NIL, and we'll close it out after this. Uh, by the time he gets, when you look at the the commentary about him on the message boards and other outlets out there, by the time he arrives wherever he's going, he's he's going to be one of those examples of, of what what is the high end for an incoming freshman in NIL, especially if he's out of Carolina or Duke, that's going to be really interesting because he's going to, everyone's going to know who he is long before he shows up and it will be a highly anticipated arrival at either place. So he'll, he'll get some NIL money and that'll be interesting to see just how much he gets. If he goes to one of those two places. And I hope he gets all he can get because man, he's a good, his family, his dad's the best. And, and, and I, I I hope they do. And, And they'll, they'll tell you that it's not all about that. And I'm gonna tell you, man, it, it, it's it's good. It's it's like that all goes with it. But when they say that it's not all about that, I he, his dad's the kind of guy I believe because you know he, when I talk to him, he just always he's about um, you know about Hubert being a good family man, you know, and is what they, they wanted to you know meet the wife. His wife wanted to talk to. Hugh, Hubert's wife and uh, um, all of that. And it's it just kind of wholesome. And, and, it, it, and he said, you know, he says this, was, and, and Sergio Welcher, who is um, Simeon's dad, said the same thing. You know, they both said, we're not done raising our kid. Yeah. You know, they're only going to be 18 years old. So I want to go some him to go somewhere that I trust that is going to help me continue to raise my kid. All the work that I put in is not going to be thrown out the window because he gets into a bad apple or go to a bad situation. It's important to these people. Yeah. So, uh, and I'm going to tell you, and if you ever sit down and talk to, to Bishop Jackson, you'll agree on it 100% because, I mean, it's just, he's just, it's just so pleasant to talk to that they've got good priorities on this thing. So, yeah, the NIL is great, but, and I think obviously anywhere you go, if you go to Carolina or Duke, it's it's the structure that they're they're not going to be, you know, yeah. they're they're going to be outlaws running around wild. So it, it's so, but but that's going to that's going to go into the that's going to go into the equation. And, and nine months into the Hubert Davis regime, if there's any absolute, um, that is one of the absolutes we, that hey, he is cult, he is cultivating that kind of culture in the program. You'll love this one because you. I watched the game, the Virginia game on ESPN, and obviously you were at the game. You did, but they have the segment where they do like the sixty set or the ninety-four foot walk with Jay Bill. Yeah. Have you seen it before? Where they asked the yeah. question. So he is. He did it with Armando Baycott. Oh, cool. So walking down the court. So he asked Baycott, "Have you ever heard Hubert Davis use profanity?" And he said, never. And he said, have you ever heard Jeff Lebo use profanity? And he said, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. And, of course, Jay Billis played with it. They knew each other. They were at the, I guess, the same time Lebo was at. Yeah, Billis was like, right. So when he said, I had to get Lebo that followed, in. Yeah. We know each other so long. But yeah, I thought that was. But, That's yeah. great. I, I, didn't, I, haven't, I haven't watched the replay of the game yet. Uh, that's, you know, Lebo and Hubert are very, very good friends. And, uh, I like that dynamic there. That's pretty cool. By the way, we all, we last year and even the year before we occasionally get a cuss word out of Armando in post game interviews. And I don't believe we've gotten one this year. So maybe Hubert's rubbing off on him a little bit. Well, that's good. My mom used to say all the time, if you're going to change, change for the better. Yeah. That, I could probably use some of that too. Cause I let a, you know, Cause my, my, my daughter, my 12 year old daughter gets on me language. I get those every couple of times a week. So demerit point, demerit points with the daughter. 
So Hubert would definitely give her an A plus and give me an F. So David, great stuff, I, man. I always always enjoy story. talking about I always this stuff. Leave yeah. the story. When Kevin O'Neill coached at Tennessee. Oh god. I know. First before you if it's Kevin O'Neill, it's gonna involve cuss words, but go yes. on. Yes. When he got to the University of Tennessee, the local, one of the <laughs> local stations, I believe it was WBIR Channel 10. We're going to do uh, a little uh, piece there on the broadcast, like on game day and things for Tennessee basketball program. So they're going to get, they go in a, and, and they ask if they can go in for his pregame talk and use a little snippet. And they said, you know, if you'll agree, we'll, we'll use it. If you're fine, we'll just use this. And he said, yeah, well, okay, it's fine. He gave like a, two to three minute talk and they couldn't find anywhere that they could use because he dropped and the person told me this was there related story to me and if i'm off on a number it's not by much but in like two or three minutes he dropped 54 f-bombs in like two minutes and they couldn't even get like a two or three second segment out of it so there was nothing they could use i could listen to kevin o'neill stories for a long time because <laughs> they are Unbelievable. Uh, and I know you've got a few of them. Oh, a few. Yeah. All right, my friend. All right. He's David Sisk. I'm Andrew Jones. You've been listening to another UNC basketball recruiting podcast right here on THI. We appreciate you stopping by.